verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you all know that we teach who will be judged with great restrictions. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with Christ. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder for every will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploit. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of inequity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and it's itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth came blessings and curses. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, feel olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. Our gospel reading for the day comes from the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 37. Uh, this is kind of the crux of the book of Mark. Uh, we're right about halfway through, and Jesus has spent most of his time so far tooling around Galilee. That's, that's up north. And uh, then this particular event, or this series of events happens, starting uh, in chapter 8, in which Jesus tells people who he really is and what it means for him to be the Messiah. And from this point forward, Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem. So he's, he's way up in Galilee, and from this point forward, every step that he takes is moving towards the cross. Um, this is the, the crux of the narrative. It is what it is to believe, to be, to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, and it's a major turning point in Christ's gospel. So I invite you to listen now to the word of God to you. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anything, not to tell anyone about them. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called to the crowd. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? This is the word of the Lord. Apologies if you can't hear me very well. Our, our microphones aren't working right now. We don't know why. Um, but if you can't hear me, just, just raise a hand and I'll try to speak a little louder. Uh, and if not, as in every Presbyterian church, we stay in the front row. So if you read up on, uh, on the Gospels, one of the things that you'll read is that the people 
at Jesus' time, the Jewish people at Jesus' time, were expecting the Messiah. Yeah, this is true, but it's only part of the truth. A more accurate way to say it would be that the people of Jesus' time were expecting a Messiah. See, a Messiah just means anointed one. Christ is, is the Greek word for Messiah. So Christ and Messiah are, are synonyms. And what it means is anointed one. And, and it's not that there was just one Messiah. Messiah was the one who was anointed by God to liberate the people. So David was a Messiah. King Cyrus of Persia, who was a, a, a king that hundreds of miles away, maybe thousands of miles away, defeated the Babylonians and freed the people to, to go uh, to end the exile. King Cyrus in Isaiah is written about as a Messiah. You might think about, uh, for a modern example, Abe Lincoln, when he signed the Emancipation Proclamation. He functioned as a Messiah. He was the liberator of people. That is, that's how uh, they would have understood that action. It was, it was a messianic action. And in the most recent Messiah, the people of Jesus' time, was a fellow named Judah Maccabee, who led a revolt against the Seleucid dynasty in around 163 BC that created, for the first time in almost 400 years, an independent kingdom of Judaism, a, a fully sovereign state for the Jews in the land of Israel. That's the revolt that they talk about when they're talking, uh, when, when they tell the story of Hanukkah. Judah Maccabee was a uh, Messiah. And that kingdom lasted until about 63 years before the birth of Christ, when it was uh, conquered by the general Pompey of the Romans. And then from that point forward, they were under Roman rule. 63 years before the birth of Christ, or a time close to the birth of Christ, is, is just enough time for most people not to have remembered or experienced that time, but it's not enough time for people to have forgotten. Everybody of Jesus' generation would have grown up with people around that remembered independence, that remembered freedom, that remembered liberty, and they would have heard stories about it. All of them knew that they had once been free. And so people's expectations for a Messiah were, were often around these things, uh, but they're not limited to that. The, the Roman rule was oppressive. It was like any other major empire the rule. The point of, of ruling a place like Judah is to extract tax value. And so all of the, the money that they generated got siphoned off and sent to Rome to pay for the bread and the circuses, all of, all of that thing, and pay for the armies and things like that. And when all of the value gets siphoned up out of society, people have trouble buying food. Um, and that's what was going on. It was a, a time of, of suffering and oppression. Um, and some people were expecting or hoping for somebody like Judah Maccabee, a sort of warrior priest, to throw off the yoke of their conquerors and liberate them. But other people were expecting something different. Other people had given up on this world altogether and were hoping for some sort of otherworldly, cosmic, messiah kind of thing. Elijah figures very prominently in that because in 2 Kings, Elijah does not die, but he's taken off into heaven. So it's assumed that Elijah, can, you know, he, he left that way, he can come back any time that way. And so a lot of the expectations were centered around Elijah, and that's why Elijah keeps coming up in stories about Jesus. Uh, but there was a sense, a, a general sense, and it's hard to say anything sort of concretely because Jerusalem then, and Jerusalem now, was a remarkably diverse place religiously. But there was a sense among wide, widely differing bodies within their social structure that they were in need of someone to save the poor people thought that, there was, that they needed someone to save them, but the, the rich people thought that they needed someone to save them too. All of them were hoping for liberation. All of them were hoping for salvation. And that's maybe where this story and this world touches our world. Because all of us are hoping for salvation too. We don't, we don't often use the word salvation in our, in our daily lives when we talk about it, it, it sort of evokes uh, Reformation and Great Awakening era arguments about theology. But we, we do want to be saved. 
We do want to be liberated. We do want to be free. We have debts that we don't know if we can pay. We have worries. Am I ever going to be able to retire? Did I retire too early? We, we have anxieties about what is going to happen to us. What's going to happen to our family? What are, what are things going to work out? We have real things that we want to be saved from. We have real things that we are held captive to, and, and, and we want some sort of saving. Now, we can talk about this sort of economically for, for a second. When there is demand for a savior in a free market economy, what happens? We get it. We get saviors. I mean, that's, that's what happens. There's, there's all this demand we all want to be saved from something, whether it's, it's medical or mental or emotional or financial or, or physical. And so the market generates opportunities for people to be saved. It generates saviors for us. You can watch any 30 minutes of broadcast TV anywhere, and you will find plenty of them, right? You know those commercials where somebody is sitting at their desk and they're holding their head and everything's black and white, uh, and then 15 seconds later they're taking a pill and now everything is in color, and they're taking a long walk on the beach, or maybe they're playing with their children now. And that's, that's a promise of salvation. The, the black and white and the headache will be gone, the, the long walks on the beach will be here. I watch uh, college football and it's targeted at a, at a pretty specific and narrow age uh, and social group. And so I see a lot of uh, prudential commercials and financial planning commercials. <laughs> you know, like we, we start at the kitchen table and we have all these anxieties about oh, the other amount of pay for this. Oh, but then, you know, uh, such and such a financial advisor comes in. They really listen. <laughs> and now, I have tons of money somehow. <laughs> we have a demand, we have a need to be saved. Uh, and so the market generates saviors for us. Now, we, we think of this as sort of a unique situation for ourselves, but all the way back at the time of Jesus, this was just as true. There was a demand for Messiahs, and there were plenty of Messiahs. There was no shortage of Miracle workers in first century Jerusalem. You can, you can look them up, you can learn about one of my favorite is Tony the Circle Drawer, H O N I, just Google it. It's a, it's a, it's a nice little story. Uh, Jesus wasn't even the only miracle worker named Jesus in the first century who was proclaiming some sort of solution to their problems. Messiahs were a, a dime a dozen, um, and, and they, were, they were different. Uh, some of them were advocating a military solution, some of them were advocating a uh, sort of withdrawal from the world solution, but there was no shortage of promises of salvation for people at the time. There's a shortage of actual salvation, which uh, of course mostly generates more promises of salvation. It's that law of supply and demand again. That's the context that begins the book of Mark. We, we, we're starting in verse 1. We didn't get to that there. Uh, okay. Mark begins his gospel saying, this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. That is Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So from the beginning, we know that Mark thinks that this is the Messiah. This is the one who will save us. We know that. But the disciples know that. Right? They've got to figure this all out on their own. And, and so they, you know, follow him. They were, some of them were fishing on a boat. He says, come, follow me. And they said, well, that's better than fishing. And so they do. And then they're with him for this period of time. And they watch these things happen. These things that, that they can't really explain, but that show that Jesus has power, right? Real power. He can cast out demons. He can heal the sick, the blind, the lame. He has a way of, of teaching, of, of talking about God, that, that makes people listen and understand. He has a different vision of what the world will look like. But even, even late in their time with him, they're still 
themselves, who is this guy? Who is this man, they say, that the wind and the seas obey him? And now we get to our passage here, and finally they recognize who Jesus is. He's the Messiah. He's a Messiah. He is the one who will bring salvation for the people. He has all of this power we know. He's got means. He's got motive. He's got opportunity. He's the guy. And it feels, I think, for them, like it's sort of a, a triumph. And if, if you're reading along for, for the whole book, you're like, finally, guys, because we've known from verse 1, right? Come to us. But they didn't get to hear the narrator. So finally, he is the Messiah. And then the rug gets pulled out from under us again. The rug gets pulled out from under here, but the rug gets pulled out from under us, too. And Mark sort of points to it with this, this feeling that I talked about to the kids. At first, he can see but not that tool. And that's where we are when we recognize that Jesus is the Savior. That Jesus is the one who can save us. But now is when Jesus makes it clear. Now is when Jesus says, this is what your salvation will look like. And that's a whole different thing. They would much go, rather go back to that sort of blurry vision if they can. He says, the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the chief priests, the scribes, the authorities, and be killed. That does not necessarily feel like salvation, does it? That's not what they were hoping for. He has all of this power. Why does he not use it? That's, that's the question, right? And it says in, in the book, it says, he said all this quite openly. Now, a lot of times Jesus tells everybody to keep things a secret, right? When Peter says, you are the Messiah, he says, don't tell anybody. What, what, what Mark means when he says openly is not that he's revealing a secret. He's, he's saying it clearly. He's saying it in a way that is directly clear. This isn't a vague metaphor or a parable or something like that. He's, he's saying it very explicitly. He's laying the whole thing out. This is exactly what's going to happen. It, it's just that the disciples don't want to hear it. Over the next three or four chapters, they're going to try every other way to think about power in order to, to see some other path of salvation. That's why Peter goes inside. Because this is not the, the power of salvation that I want. This is not the salvation that I want. But it's the salvation that is true. Because the most profound power that we encounter is the power of powerlessness. That is... What Jesus says is, is true. If we want to save our lives, we will lose it. If we want to keep going, no, if we want to keep our lives, yeah, if we want to save our lives, we'll that if we want to save our lives, we'll lose it. If we lose our lives, we save them. It, it, it's, it's contradictory, but that's the, the wisdom and the folly of the cross. It's this idea that, that God wanted to save the world and God tried every possibility to use power to save the world, to enforce the salvation of the world. He tried the carrot, he tried the stick. God, God did everything that God could do, but finally God came around to the realization that, that who we are is in need of somebody not who can enforce the rules, but somebody who can live with us in, in, the, in the messy and in the painful and difficult parts of our lives. Somebody who knows what it is to need salvation. And so God came down to us to be with us, to know us, to experience that, that, that fear and, and, and that abandonment and, and that anxiety that we, that we all have that need for salvation. And then reveal that love is more powerful than that. 
And the truth is, to love somebody is to be vulnerable. If, if, you, if you want to love somebody really and truly, you've got to open yourself up to the possibility that you can be. And that's what God does in Jesus Christ. God opens up the possibility that God can be hurt, and God is hurt. Because exactly what we would think happens, happens. The Son of Man goes before the chief priests, and he is rejected. He goes uh, before the people, and he is rejected. And eventually, he is killed. And God knows all of that suffering because God chose it for us. God's love is revealed in that choice to be present with us, to be present uh, in our suffering, and to know us. And so what he's telling us is that all of these things that we want to save us, if, if we're watching the news every day, expecting some sort of political champion to come out of it and fix all of the things that are broken in our world, that's, that's not going to happen. If we're, we're watching the, the commercials that, that we're hoping that our final life, life is going to turn to color, that's not going to happen. If, if we're looking for salvation to try to find it for ourselves, we can't. The path to salvation leads through love. And love means loving somebody else enough to suffer. Loving somebody else enough to, to put yourself behind and to put them in front. That's what God did for us. And that's what we're called to do for each other. If we want to save our lives, we we'll lose them. But if we give them up in love to our neighbors, to our brothers and our sisters and our friends and people, who are, are near and the people who are poor, then we will find our salvation. Then we will find our peace. Because we will have made ourselves one with the love of the universe. That is, God who is revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.